The next session is then how do we get there? How do we how do we achieve our objectives? Uh, we we uh, I'm basing a lot of this information on what we tried here in my state. Uh, we were much more successful in 2017 than we were in 2019, but you know you learn from failures. So, uh, just to uh, talk to, to let you know what we'll be covering in this presentation. Uh, we will review again the objectives of the Summit for Democracy. Uh, we'll talk about the key roles found in state party organizations. And then we'll talk about a typical state organization and their elections. And uh, Selena talked a little bit about this in her presentation. And this just expands on it a bit. Uh, we'll talk about a timeline for the activities in getting ready for 2022. 20, uh, and then next steps for getting started. So at the top of the hour, we will reconvene and each of you uh, are invited to join with your region's breakout session. Uh, your room leader will lead a discussion about next steps and answer your particular questions that you might have that we can address in this greater forum. Uh, so you're more than welcome to ask them there. And if they don't know the answer, we will find out the answers for you and get back to you. So the objectives that we have to achieve a greater democracy is to elect the majority of delegates in the state party organizations in order to elect pro-democracy officers. Uh, now, fortunately, they have uh, prepared the way for us and they have, uh, they have given the state chairs vast powers. So as Judith is finding in Nevada, uh, all those powers that they've been, they've been handing over from the membership to the chair, she now has, and we can, we can do the same thing for any of the chairs that we elect. Um, in my state, the, the state chair appoints all the members, um, uh, a set of the members to the standing committees, uh, which often make, uh, uh, make the deciding vote on something that passes or not. And so we would have that power if we, if we captured the, the chair positions. In addition to cleaning up the state parties, then we need to elect the majority of delegates to the Democratic National Committee so that the bylaws can be modified. And uh, also Selena told us what the numbers are for uh, get, getting that done. And she demonstrated that it is eminently achievable. And so what we need to do is elect the DNC members from each state. Now, these are four-year terms. And so it is gonna be a while before uh, the most of them will be reelected, uh, but you know it's, it's none of this happens overnight, and as long as we plan for it, we we can prevail. So these are the positions that you typically find in your state organization if you're not involved in your state state party. So there's usually a party chair, and these are either paid or unpaid. Uh, it is the highest office in the state. And they are also, as Selena pointed out, a DNC delegate. Um, they belong to an organization called the ASDC, which uh, is where they get together and learn from other state parties. And uh, I would, I've been to one of these meetings, but I was never in one of the meetings where they, they plotted out how to take away power. So uh, that's something that I'd like to get invited to. Um, the first vice chair, is has to be of the opposite gender or and uh, possibly uh, non-binary. And uh, they're also a DNC delegate and they are also uh, probably elected by the state organization, whether it is called the central committee or the executive committee, you'll have to read your state bylaws to see how that is specifically done in your state. And then we have the DNC delegates. And as you saw, Selena described how those were elected. And they represent the, each of the states in the Democratic National Committee. Uh, the number varies and they seem to be based on the number of Democrats in each state. And you have to be a little bit forgiving about this because there are states that do not have party registration. So they've had to come up with workarounds for how to come up with those numbers. And uh, you know, I, I've seen how they do it and it does make a lot of sense. So there's nothing particularly evil going on in, in that process. It's just that without a voter registration, it's hard to determine what a Democrat is. Um, from a membership perspective. Uh, Selena also talked about the lowest building block of the party, which is the precinct committee person. 
Uh, I think it is called something else in Washington state. So they might have different names, but really what these are, are uh, the, the, the lowest common, uh, the, the lowest position in the party that, that cast votes in the party structure. Uh, some, some states have them uh, woven into the organ, into the statutes. And so like in my state, you can look up the Oregon statutes that govern the election of precinct committee persons. We actually go through the county elections office and you file to run like in any office. And, and uh, if uh, you, you, the Democrats don't want you to get rid of you, they have to actually run a recall process in my state, uh, which you can imagine is, is fairly onerous and doesn't happen, but uh, that's the, what happens when you get uh, officially elected. Um, I'm very curious about what the process is in states like West Virginia that don't have them elected that way, but there's some other process for you to get involved. And so that is the first level that where we need to occupy. And they're usually organized by county. And so your data person needs to basically figure out, you know, all the counties in your state and then all the positions within the counties that need to be elected or how many, how many precinct committee persons or these grass level units have to be elected in order to get a majority in each one of the counties. There's uh, often congressional district officers that have some role in the party. And again, uh, it varies from state to state. So you have to read the state bylaws to see if there's any value in pursuing those. In my state, the congressional districts elect the members to the standing committees and, uh, and uh, Four years ago, we were able to uh, elect the majority, which meant that we could uh, basically uh, ensure that fair uh, bylaws amendments and rules were being proposed to the, the membership. We were not so lucky in this last go round and uh, we were in a minority. And so uh, we, have to, uh, we have to bear with some very unfortunate bylaws changes that that keep getting generated by this committee and pass the membership. Um, the secretary is an important one because they are the recording of the minutes. So they, they typically aren't a, a voting member in the DNC, uh, but uh, as I found out in my party, uh, I cannot go back and trace a lot of the bylaws changes that occurred over the past 20 years because the secretary failed to record the motions that generated the bylaws changes. And so there are a good half dozen changes to our bylaws in my state that I do not know the origin of, and they look very suspicious, but unfortunately, because the minutes of the meetings were poorly kept, I can't reconstruct how they came about. And then there might be other positions. You just have to read through your bylaws to see if they are worth pursuing. So those are the positions that, that we have to go after, whatever they are in your specific state. So what I will now go through is uh, what we do here in Oregon, which is roughly equivalent to what happens in every one of the states with your various flavors. So this, uh, this chart reads from left to right. And so what you have in the far left side are in my state, the registered Democrats. And so in the uh, May primary and even numbered years, we elect the precinct committee persons in, within each county. We file to run for that office. And so if this is a similar process in your county, you need to find out the, the procedure for filing. Um, the, it is unusual for parties to, to go out and actually uh, try to get more people involved because uh, it, would, it would broaden the base and get more people interested in what's going on. Usually the only hint of this going on in my state is that uh, people get a a ballot in with the rest of their ballots and they have these things called precinct committee persons and some of their neighbors are on there and they, they have to decide whether or not to vote for them, but they have no idea what that is or what that means uh, because this has been dropped pretty much from our culture. But anyway, that is the basic building blocks of the party and where the battle begins for control of the organization. So the precinct committee persons or whatever the role is then form a county committee, uh, which is the, the governing body for your county party. In my state, there is a clean separation made between the county organizations and the state organization. So the state organization has no control 
over the county organizations. It is the county organization that elects the delegates to the state central committee then who goes on to elect uh, uh, the officers. So there is some layer in the middle, however they get elected, then it becomes uh, electable by the, the people who become precinct committee persons. And that's why it is so important to get that majority right there. Because if you don't have a majority in each one of these layers, then it becomes an uphill fight to, to uh, get control. And really this is about uh, control and power, which became starkly relevant and obvious in, what, in the struggle that ensued in Nevada. So you have either a state central committee or you have a executive council or whatever that body is at the state level that is supposed to be the governing body for the party in your state. Uh, what has happened in many of the states, and we've discovered this as we go through states bylaws, is that a lot of power has been allocated from the membership to the uh, presiding officers and to the committees and to the boards. Uh, in my state, the central committee does very little more than pass feel good resolutions at the state central committee meetings. They rarely make any decision except uh, when we elect officers, which happens every two years. Um, we would like to change that so that that the state central committee in our state is more relevant and people have more of a participation in the affairs of the party, but uh, that is the scenario that we are in now uh, and we need to claw our way back. The state central committee then elects in your, what, what is called the reorganization, they elect the party officers and the DNC members. So as I said earlier, the DNC members are elected basically every four years uh, and they happen uh, somewhere around the convention and each state has their own different rules on when those occur. Uh, I believe they have to occur before the end of the first quarter following the presidential election. Um, uh, we, are, we are stuck with the DNC members that are currently in place unless for some reason they leave office or they are recalled. So if they are end up being egregious, you do have the right to recall some of them, but again, you have to have the votes in order to be successful. And so you have to think through the, uh, whether that is a good way to spend your time. The state central committee also elects the chairs and the vice chairs and the other officers. And because these are members of this, also members of the state central committee or the DN DNC, we care very much about who gets elected to those positions. And if we have a majority on the state central committee or the executive committee, then we have uh, the controlling votes to determine who, who gets elected to those. So this is a high level timeline between now and 2023 on what should you, we should be doing. So if you are unfamiliar with the structure of your state party, uh, this is the time to start getting prepared for what we do next. This is when you collect the bylaws, you document your state structure, of who elects who, basically doing a diagram like I just showed for uh, my state. Uh, you need to document the dates of the elections so you know when people are running. If there's filing dates, you need to uh, document those as well. Uh, so you don't, uh, you don't uh, wake up one morning and find out that last Friday was the filing date and you've been screwed by the system once again. And then you need to determine the number of votes you need for each of these positions. In my state, uh, there are far more theoretical positions for precinct committee persons than are filled. And it's only in the, the last couple of years that a couple of the counties, they've actually become competitive. So all you need to do in many cases is just get someone to file the piece of paper to run. And because they will be the most, they're, they'll likely be the most, the only candidate, they will get elected. That is how easy it is to take over a lot of these county parties is just show up and file the paperwork. We have, we have county, we have two counties whose parties, whose county parties have, have, uh, have been abandoned. And there was one county where I had one person file to run for precinct committee person. And because of the, the, the state law says that only the elected precinct committee persons can elect the officers at any point in time, this person can elect the chair, the vice chair, 
and their their uh, officers or their delegates to the state central committee uh, by one vote. And this also happened in another county where there were actually two people elected as precinct committee persons. One got irritated with the Democratic Party and left, which again left one person to vote for all of the officers. So that's an immense amount of power for someone who all they did was just file a piece of paper. Uh, and in my state, it only takes three votes to be elected precinct committee person. So if you and you have a partner who will vote for you, you just need to track down one another friend and you can lock in your three votes. Beginning in day, Labor Day, which is the traditional start of the, uh, the campaign session, uh, set, season, uh, and January 1st is when you need to start recruiting candidates for the positions. You know, hopefully when you hit January, by mid-January, you have your, your precinct committee person candidates or whatever that level is uh, identified. You know your numbers that you need to, to target and how many people you need to recruit, and you have informed them of the process for filing. And if it takes having them file the papers and then give them to you and then you turn them into the elections office or whatever the process is in your state, uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, it is that simple. Uh, we, have, we have turned in literally hundreds of uh, uh, filings for candidates for precinct committee persons in, in counties in my state uh, uh, on their behalf because people get busy and they forget about this stuff. And it's, if, if it's legal to do so, it's much easier for you to collect them and then make sure that they get delivered to the, the whatever agency handles them. Then in, when we get to 2022, uh, it, every state will have its own timeline for the election of candidates. And this is something that you'll need to document. Again, the filing date, the qualifications for running and uh, the, the dates that the elections occur. And if you have that information, uh, you, can, you can start running effective campaigns. Uh, a lot of these positions have been traditionally held by the same people year after year after year. I know we had DNC members in my state that were just automatically elected because no one really cared about them until they became important positions in 2016. And now they are much more competitive uh, and much more attention is given to who gets elected there. So uh, any those who have the most data on what's going on will probably prevail. And then uh, starting in probably uh, Q4 of 2022 uh, through Q1 of 2023 is when most of the states elect their officers. And again, you need to verify this, but usually around the time after the presidential election or when, or that, that time frame uh, in November through the end of Q1 is when count states do their reorganization and you do your election of state officers. Uh, again, you need to document the times. My state, uh, it turns out that we have uh, allowed the state officers to determine the dates on which these will happen. And the, in, in my state, the chair decided that she would go around and get pledged votes for her candidacy before she, uh, she, she released the timeline for other people to register to vote. And so any can all the candidates who were going to run against her found out that, that the chair had locked up all of the votes and, and uh, she won. We're going to try and get some rules in place where this becomes uh, a more transparent process and that kind of thing doesn't go on. Again, there's nothing wrong with asking for pledged votes, but that's not a thing. There's no such thing as pledging your vote to a candidate. Um, <clears throat> So again, the next steps for you, and you, we will also go through these in the breakout session, is make sure that if you do not know where they are, you've obtained a copy of your state bylaws, your special rules and standing rules, um, and, and understand them. And if they are difficult to understand, uh, you know, one of the things we do in People for Democratic Party Reform is on a monthly basis, we take a state's bylaws and we go through them and we, we explain to people how to dissect the bylaws and look for key pieces of information like, what is the prior notice requirement for meetings? Uh, 
uh, if you don't get a notice of a meeting and the meeting occurs, uh, you can actually contest it because that is called a continuing breach. Uh, things you want to know is what are the roles and responsibilities of the officers? Because if they are not listed, then it is not something, it is not a power that is given to them. A uh, key thing is who is a member? Who has the right to vote? Uh, as a member of an organization, you have the right to attend meetings, which is why you get prior notice. You have the right to speak and debate. You have the right to make motions and you have the right to vote. And all of these are rights, which uh, we find various levels of, of uh, pressure being uh, on to take these away. Uh, and we need to fight back and demand that, that our rights are respected. And so the definition of a member determines who has the right to attend the meetings and, and do these things. And the, the one thing of the four that is not exercised enough is the right to make motions. So you as a member of your state party, if you are elected that position, can make a motion from the floor. Uh, and as long as it's seconded, it's at least debated and voted upon. One of the things that we would like to do is start exercising this right at the DNC meetings themselves. Because as you can imagine, the DNC meetings are lots of ceremony and light on business. I have never seen, I was a DNC member for three years and I never saw a member go up to a microphone and make a motion from the floor, which any of the DNC members could have done. Uh, as a member, you have the right to make motions from the floor. Uh, you want to, again, diagram the state party structure. You want to create a calendar of election events so you know when all these things are happening. Um, uh, you need to determine the number of positions. You need to fill it to obtain a majority and, and then create and document a plan. So all of these things will be covered in the, the breakout sessions in further detail and give you an opportunity to talk more locally uh, since we are breaking up by state, uh, hopefully this will be an opportunity for you to start networking with other people in your state if they show up. And, and if they're not there, uh, perhaps they're a member of PDPR. And if you join PDPR, we can, we can start getting you networking with other people in your, your state because it's only by working together that we're going to uh, be successful. <laughs>